Hello, party people, and welcome to an episode of Office Hours coming to you from Hong Kong, the harbor on Hong Kong. Um, I'm at uh, the Regent Hotel here, hanging out, and uh, came to Hong Kong for a conference, actually. I'm, uh, I go through different phases of my career. Sometimes I'm sharing what I've learned. Sometimes I spend more time learning. And uh, this trip is one of those examples where, <laughs> yes, it's also a mix of vacation, too. Uh, but where I attended a small local event on big data and AI put on by a local uh, university because um, wanted to see, I never hear a lot about what's happening in other parts of the world and how they do database events. Uh, so I wanted to come here to see a, a kind of a different angle on how the database world works. Um, Similarly, I'm going to a Postgres conference uh, next month in April up in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, so doing a little bit more learning here for a while than I am sharing, which is kind of fun. Although right now it's time to do some sharing by taking your questions from over at PollGab and let's go see what y'all are talking or asking about. First up is Jason who asks, would you elaborate on database owner implications? He says, SP Blitz recommends using the SA account, but articles also advocate for using low-privileged accounts, which are database-specific. Which do you recommend and why? Okay, in theory, you should be using different accounts for every database. In theory, you should be using the principle of least privileged, where no one is a database owner, they only have the rights to read or write data, they don't have the rights to change uh, schema objects. In practice, I know how y'all work. In practice, you write the essay account on a post-it note, you take pictures of that post-it note, and you send it to your friends and enemies. All I'm trying to do is at least get you to not use uh, per people's personal accounts to be the database owners and start to graduate towards something a little bit more safe. So both of us kind of agree there. Andreas's articles about different user accounts for every database are great, but make sure that you read them in completion and follow them completely, otherwise you can end up in worse security instead of better. Next up, my tea got cold asks, can you name any good relational databases that aren't built around SQL? He says, it's strange that a system so old is still the best. It's so funny that you say that. I have a blog post coming out on brentozar.com in the next couple few weeks about whether or not the SQL language is archaic. The nice thing about SQL is that all front ends can use it, all back ends can use it in slightly different flavors, and reporting tools can use it. Whereas when you build something new, like when MongoDB first came out and it didn't support SQL, the running joke was is that you just couldn't get a report out of it. Managers would say, all right, how do I hook up uh, business objects or crystal reports or Power BI, how would I hook up these to MongoDB? And there was kind of a lot of, well, uh, I'm not exactly sure how you would do that. And that just doesn't cut it in the business world. So new languages or new ways of accessing data are going up against that established language where SQL just really works well for reporting purposes. Next up, John says, Hello, Brent. Is SQL Server 2022 ready for production in prime time, or are there more still bugs and issues? I'm asking because you haven't written on it since 2023. Well, what's changed? What's changed since 2023? Have they removed those bugs? Are the features done yet? It is as of right now, March 2024, and the prime feature for SQL Server 2022, failing over back and forth between Azure managed instances and on-premises availability groups, still isn't in general availability. So before you ask me if it's ready, go read that post and see if anything in there has changed. When it's changed, I'll update it. 
Next up, a question that's highly related to one we just had there. Chicago Joe says, is there a trend to move database access to APIs only? I'm asking because our, we're moving to our next version of our ERP platform and our CIO has told our database developers that the only access to the database will be through a web API. Where that's, where that's common and uh, desirable is when the database itself doesn't perform all of the features that the enterprise wants. And I'll give you a few examples. Row level security, logging of every query and every result set. So when you don't have those built into the database itself, it's common to build a layer of abstraction. Common's probably the wrong term, but it's it's, doable to build a level of abstraction between the application and the underlying database. So then that gives you the flexibility to add the features that enterprises really want. Now, I'll tell you the SQL Server itself supports those features. SQL Server itself does row level security. It does uh, tracking of every select statement and its results if you want to go down that route. But a lot of other databases do not and that's where that API level comes in, especially in enterprises, and you're talking about ERP software. Next up, Jay Fisher says, Hey Brent, are you able to comment or explain on SQL Server's native geography and geometry data types, CLR, and how they can use and exhaust memory? I keep getting unloading due to memory pressure. So, uh, the thing when my clients want to use their own CLR code inside the database server, I try to gently remind them of two things. One is that SQL Server is licensed per CPU core. So anything you do that's CPU intensive, you're going to be paying two to $7,000 US per core to do that. Whereas app servers are carry the one free. So it usually makes more sense to do those on the app server. The other thing that I'll gently remind them of is, is your development team good at troubleshooting memory leaks in their own code? Show me an example recently of where the developers had to troubleshoot growing memory utilization in their code, what their thought process was and how they went about fixing that. And if the answer is never, or they can't remember when, then you probably don't want to be using memory on the SQL Server, where it's like the most expensive memory that you have, and troubleshooting CLR memory is even harder than it is in application servers. Now, that has nothing to do with geography and ge uh, geometry data types. Those aren't serious memory consumers. They're not really CPU consumers. Yes, you can end up burning CPU if your queries are crappy, but that's kind of another story altogether. I'm much more worried about the fact that you said CLR. That's where I'm getting concerned. Next up, Steven asks, Hi Brent, oh man, I should take a drink. It's been a while since I've taken a drink here. Why am I not leveraging that? As far as you know, that's non-alcoholic and not in any way loaded with rum. But I'll tell you something really cool. The Regent Hotel here has this really cool doorbell button. So I just whenever I want more drinks or whatever, I can just push the button. How cool is that? Love that, because I'm lazy. Steve says, is there a way to assess overall reads per table to see which tables we want to focus our index tuning efforts on? Yes. SP Blitz Index, Mode 2, and then you can sort order. You can use the sort order parameter to sort by reads. You can sort by all kinds of columns. That's really useful. If you want to learn more about that and see more about how that's used, check out my class, Fundamental, I'm sorry, uh, uh, How I Use the First Responder Kit. How I Use the First Responder Kit class. Next up, Neil says, our developers think that Azure will solve all their problems. They don't understand that we're already SQL on an Azure VM. They're committing all the same mistakes that, they, that created disasters on premises. What surprises are they in for? The way that you scale Azure, as with any cloud provider, is with your credit card. 
If you're having problems with resources today, the cloud can solve that problem for you as long as you have plenty of memory. Or, I'm sorry, plenty of money. I have clients that do that, and we jokingly call it throwing cloud at the problem. And the cloud expenses might seem expensive to you at first, but if you put them in comparison or in relation to what an additional developer would cost you, it may not be that bad. Like if you're looking at a $10,000 a month cost in the cloud, and you're like, oh my God, we gotta get that down. Well, how many devel developers would it take to go back and fix all that code? Or would you rather go focus your existing developers on adding features that more clients will pay for? You'd be surprised at how often companies say, you know what, let's just consider this the same as hiring a developer. Let's throw another $10,000 a month in Azure and just let it go while we continue to let our teams build more features in. Now that doesn't work forever. There are some processes that don't scale linearly with spend, but that's the way that I would encourage you to think about it is that it, it opens up new options as long as you're willing to spend it. <laughs> For some reason, Dreamcatcher asks, what time do you like to go to bed and wake up and do you nap after lunch? My typical schedule is that I'll go to bed around eight or nine o'clock, somewhere in there, uh, and then I'll wake up around three or four a.m., somewhere in there. Uh, and then I usually nap after lunch for about 45 minutes or an hour. I don't need to set a, an alarm. I can just wake up after about 45 minutes and then uh, go right back uh, to whatever I want to do. Next up, Chomping Bit says, what do you think is the difference between ADF and SSMS? ADF is Azure Data Factory. Um, I think you're thinking of the wrong tool. I think you're thinking of Azure Data Studio, it, which you could call ADS, but nobody abbreviates it that way. He says, Azure Data Factory, but he's wrong, has query plans and access to tools and reports. How long do you think that Microsoft will continue to offer both tools? I don't know and I don't care. Um, Microsoft has no attention span when it comes to these types of tools. Over the years, they've thrown all kinds of things against the wall for tooling. Um, I, I don't even try to guess or pretend. Just work with whatever you have now and feels comfortable. Who knows what you'll have in two or three years? It's really hard to predict. And then we'll do one more. Let's see here. Um, <laughs> Gringo Malbec says, Hi Brent, we realize you recommend not using linked servers to connect to other SQL servers. But my friend asks if you find it okay to use linked servers to... No. 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 Let me teach you an important life lesson. When someone says no, you should listen to them. You should hear their concerns. Don't be like that person who says, no really means maybe. No could mean yes, depending on how they say it. That's not cool. When someone tells you no, repeatedly, there's something called a hint, and you should take that hint. It's probably a good question to end on there. So uh, today, let's see what's up uh, on the agenda, aside from finishing this drink and probably ordering another one. Mm. What's up on the agenda is we're going to uh, go get dim sum. My partner Eve is really excited about uh, doing dim sum here in Hong Kong because there's a lot of dim sum that she can get here that can't get back home in Las Vegas. Um, so we're doing that and then some walking around. There's a statue of Bruce Lee near here that I am curious to go see. Not, I don't really have anything to do with Bruce Lee, but it was just kind of funny to uh, see that. And then walking around the harbor because it's just utterly gorgeous. I like Hong Kong. So far from uh, being in Hong Kong, it really reminds me of the video game Cyberpunk 2077 or the movie The Matrix. Um, there's a lot, or Blade Runner is another one, although it's much pr 
prettier than any of those environments. There's stuff that's uh, very gorgeous. But it's this really neat mix of Britain and China and other nationalities. Um, so the signs are in all kinds of languages. It's just really cool. Um, a mix of old and new, you know, like really gritty neighborhoods, uh, dystopian skyscrapers, and then gorgeous uh, city lights too as well. So I will see y'all on the next Office Hours. Adios.